Okay, so we were addressing a few questions before we got started. Uh, one question had to do with what the cost of ADAPT was for California students and colleges, and I said that was free, freely available uh, without any issues at all for you to be able to capitalize on. The second question was, uh, what about just the textbooks themselves? Uh, any campus can create, or actually we create on behalf of that campus, a campus bookshelf that allows that campus in order to host up to five free books. And, and it's basically a single, every library has its own bookshelf, uh, and it's a collection of, you add them all together in order to create all the five books limits that we provide available. After that is exceeded, then we ask the campus to join our LibreNet uh, in order to be able to uh, make that work. Let me, um, okay. Uh, so uh, here are some examples of various uh, uh, campuses that are on our engineering bookshelf, which is a smaller bookshelf compared to some of the other bookshelves that we have available. Uh, then the question is, can textbooks have embedded interactive features? Yes, H5P can be embedded into the, uh, um, in addition to other parts of the ADAPT uh, system. And I'll show you how to go about doing that. It's a pretty straightforward button that's connected up here. Oh, Carol, I'm sorry. So if a book, if a campus has exceeded the five book uh, maximum, then we ask them to join our LibreNet uh, campus, uh, consortium that is. So the consortium uh, currently is $1,500 a year. Um, and that provides an unlimited number of books that you can customize and store on your campus bookshelves, in addition to a campus uh, branded campus commons uh, and a few additional features, including free access to our uh, Libra Tax Oktoberfest and other uh, meetings that we have. And so hopefully that addressed your questions and concerns. Uh, Jennifer Roger added a link into the chat that may be useful in order to be able to address uh, further questions. Okay, so uh, before we begin, I should probably ask, do you want me to go over any part of the <clears throat> any part of the ADAPT discussion that we had earlier on today? I understand it was a little bit uh, more complicated. Um, that's a good question, Deborah. Is, is there a way to edit questions that were imported? Yes. Uh, so when you're uh, whenever you have a question that's imported, uh, I should mention that only the editor, or let me phrase it, only the owner of the question has the ability to edit the question, hands down. So what do you do if you want to edit the question themselves? Uh, well, if you want to, you can clone the question. Uh, so this little button right here will let you clone the question. And when you do that, which I'll do it right now, uh, it it basically clones it. I can change the type. I can change where to add it if I want to, but I'm just going to clone it in this specific thing. It makes a duplicate here. And this one here, I can tell it's a clone because it has a little icon next to it. But more importantly, I have ownership rights to it. So I have the ability to go in and start to edit it. Whereas there, I wouldn't have the rights to do so. No. <clears throat> um, and I can do that. Um, click out of basic mode, I can do it under edit mode, but that goes into the editing of questions section that I didn't go into, a question topic that I didn't go over in today's discussion, which I know is relatively brief. Um, I mentioned it before, but I'll mention it again. If you go to our YouTube channel um, at youtube.libertext.org, uh, you'll see a, a lot of videos, uh, mm -hmm. including some, uh, our previous uh, LibreFest, which was this, you know, week long process. Um, and that's where I was able to go to adapt for five, six hours. Um, and you'll get a much more extended discussion behind it than I was unable to do just because of timing, trying to put this all into one day. Um, so you can go into the discussion uh, here or a few of the other ones right here in order to be able to advance that. I encourage you to do so. Uh, can we access the HTML code of the question two? Uh, Sima, I'm not entirely sure why you're asking that. Um, actually it's youtube.libretext.org, or you can just do a search of LibreText on YouTube and it will get to the same effect. Um, Sima, you, uh, so the, like this question right here, this is rendered HTML, but the underlying code here was actually written in, uh, Perl. Uh, which is the language of choice for this the specific link for uh, web work. We chose my up and math, it would be PHP uh, that's connected to that. Uh, is, is this the what you're asking about, this rendered output of the question that you would like to get access to?
It's true. Uh, yes. Um, we don't have a we don't have a button in order to export to the export the HTML. We could do that. Uh, I, many times we have a text based question off of there, but I'm removing this because this is already HTML. Uh, you know the I need to think a little bit more about how to go about doing that, and we, we would just. I mean, you always have the ability in order to inspect the source. Um, I'm not sure why that doesn't work there. And, uh, and then find the, the content uh, appropriately that's written in here. I can't remember. It should be relatively straightforward, but I don't see it here. Um, uh, and I don't know why it's not seen here. But uh, we could potentially do that. The worst case scenario is you copy it like this, and you copy and paste, and it covers most of what you need right there. Uh, uh, so, um, if there are more issues associated, let me know. I've never had anyone ask me specifically for that. Uh, and obviously, it's not going to be able to be auto uh, graded when you do it that because you're just getting the rendered output that's there. Um, the Penny asked a question Are we notified if there are edits to or copied to your questions? Yes. Uh, we won't, <clears throat> you won't be notified if anyone is cloning a copy of your question. We didn't implement that. Uh, we're not against that. I'm not sure if you'd actually want to have that. If, if you do, please let me know. Uh, but um, it, it, for H5, sorry, for um, web work and H and uh, QTI questions, we have a versioning system uh, that will tell you when the last edit was there. So let me go to the original question. Um, let me go to the one that wasn't. Yeah, so it's most likely that there are some saves. So we've had several different, we've had two revisions up here. So every time we save a revision, it just adds to the list. Sometimes we can have up to 10, 15 or so, typically not any, not much more uh, saves for that question. Uh, but again, this gets into the details associated with the question and how do you actually edit it and things like that. Uh, I will mention, uh, Sima, uh, while... This uh, gives you the, the underlying code behind it, which is not what you're asking. Um, oftentimes, our solutions are written in HTML. You can do a little copy and paste uh, there. Uh, you just have to use it with appropriate attributions because it's typically openly licensed. Okay. Any other questions or concerns that popped up? Like I said, that was a whirlwind introduction. Uh, if you feel that you're missing something, you did. Uh, and I encourage you to look at the YouTube channel for uh, taking a look at that. Uh, and if you have any questions or concerns, please come to our office hours, Tuesdays and Thursdays from 9 to 10 o'clock uh, Pacific time. Okay, so I'm going to put ADAPT to bed uh, for now. I want to ta start talking about the other aspects of, um, of the Libriverse. <clears throat> so uh, we're going to talk about remixing of books. Uh, so let's go back to here. I'm going to clear all of this and go and we start with what we started with in the beginning, which is the launch pad. Again, the launch pad is the map to the Libreverse to show you all the different aspects associated with that. Um, so we play largely with Adapt. Um, you've had some interactions with Conductor because that was part of the, um, the project associated with the... Uh, workshop. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to be discussing any of these things, or at least not going into detail behind what I've already discussed. I want to talk about the books, and that's going to be the sake of conversation for the rest of uh, this discussion here. Uh, so if you go to any of these libraries, so I'm going to go to biology. Uh, again, just to mention what I mentioned before, the books that we have are largely focused or stored in campus bookshelves, uh, or central bookshelves. The campus bookshelves are organized around individual campuses. So for example, if you go to Gettysburg College, you can take a look at the books that they have customized for their own needs. Right now for the biology library, they only have one book that's in place. However, their math library, they have a lot of books that they have already built or curated. Now these are not necessarily uh, uh, books made from scratch and they would be remit they may be remixed from existing material um uh, that's capitalizing on the corpus of content that we have right there yeah so <clears throat> let's get this thing going there are several steps involved in creating a book and that's what we're going to be starting to do from scratch in the process of creating the book we're going to be going through remixing and then editing the two 
pillars that we're going to be focusing on for the remainder of this uh, workshop. So the first, there's a workflow in order to be able to go about doing these things. And we're working on ways and simplifying this a bit. Uh, but the first step of the workflow is to get an instructor account. Now, we all have instructor accounts because you need that in order to be able to register for this account, uh, for, for this workshop. Uh, so it makes life a lot easier over here. But if there are any of your colleagues that want to be able to use the Libreverse and they don't have an instructor account, that's the first step that they need to do. So you can go to register.libertix.org in order to be able to get access to that. I'm going to sign in here uh, in order to have my instructor account. So assuming that we got step one down, the instructor account, then we want to go to step two. Now, any project that we create uh, on the Libreverse, we need to create a conductor project first. Uh, better before building the resource. And the reason for that is it gives us a centralized infrastructure to keep track of what projects are being created and the simple, simplified infrastructure to allow us as the development team to be able to come in and to help people uh, move forward because we then know the details associated with that specific project. Um, and that's what we're going to be doing by going to the conductor page. So I want everyone to go to the launch pad. Uh, <clears throat> once you're in the launch pad, I want you to click on conductor page and it's going to pop up the conductor project. Please give me a thumbs up to make sure that I know that you are there. It's going to look a little bit different than what I have, uh, what you have. Largely, I have a lot of pin projects here, which you probably have no pin projects because you're still working with this. Got a lot of thumbs, especially in the chat. Okay, so just to reiterate, uh, we can't build a resource without building a conductor project, period. So it's the first step in order to do so. So let's just take a quick look at what the conductor page looks like. Again, the conductor is the back end project management tool for the commons and conductor. Whereas the front end, if you go to it and you click on this commons, it'll flip you to it. And this is the front end associated with that which is again, a cataloging system. And this is the cataloging system for the entire corpus of uh, content that we have close to 3000 books, at least the ones that are compiled. Uh, many of them are not compiled. These are the number of assets that are connected to those. There are ancillary materials, slide decks, and other things. We just started to go through an effort in order to keep track of those uh, materials. Um, you can look at existing projects out there and existing authors that have made their resources public um, and such. The intent of it here is to make not necessarily a uh, social media sister, but to make something that is available for uh, facilitating the community that's uh, off of there. Uh, Hosea asked, has said that it won't authenticate. I'm not entirely sure. If you click on this uh, launch pad right here, uh, then you go on conductor Carol in order to be able to access it. Hosea, do you think you can? Jo Josiah, uh, it's Josiah. And it logged me Josiah. out. And it's uh, when I try to log back in, it's saying it won't authenticate when I log back in with using the same credentials. So I don't know why it's different. So so you're were you able to log in before? I had been using it all morning with no problem. So uh the uh well we were using the adapt account, not necessarily the Libra One account. Um oops. I okay. <laughs> Sorry, I think I might be able to help because I had the same problem when I played with it yesterday. Um, if you logged in, Josiah, if you logged in using the same form that we're looking at on screen, that wouldn't work. But if you click the Microsoft Azure directory or whatever and use your Coastline single sign-on, that should work because I had the same problem. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, the, that's the issue then with my computer defaulting to saving passwords then. Okay. Uh, Let me take a quick look and see. Um, I'm going to check your account. Well, it's it's the issue then, because like, you know, like I said, when I, uh, I apologize for derailing things, whenever, uh, you know, my computer saves the password. So it's, yeah, it just, it thinks it's one login because it thinks it's the same thing. So I have to backtrack to figure out what that one was. I apologize. No, that's fine. According to, my credentials, you have not signed in at all um, with your cccd.edu account. Um, let me verify that account. Okay. 
I thought I did that the other day, but I guess I did not. Unless you have multiple accounts, <clears throat> which is possible. And we're working on ways of trying to consolidate that. Uh, it's understandable that if you are an adjunct or you're teaching at multiple campuses, that you may have different accounts, different email addresses connected to it. And it can be a little uh, distracting in order to be able to do that. But if it's the CCCD account, you can sign in. If you can't sign in with your uh, Microsoft or Google for your account, then you can always uh, request to come in uh, manually. Let's see if you can actually come in with that so I can actually uh, move forward here. <clears throat> so uh, anyone else other than Josiah that's having some issues uh, coming in? Um, I'm not having an issue, but I just have a quick question. Do we have to have two separate accounts or however many accounts if we have, are we teaching at different campuses? Well, um, we don't have a problem with that per se, but if you want to hook into your campus's learning management system, then they want to have your campus's email address connected to it. Uh, so that's where you have right now two different accounts. However, we have <clears throat> uh, working on within the next month or two, a role system that will give us the ability to have it so you can basically have different accounts that are sort of coupled together. Sort of like how Google comes in when, you, uh, when you're in a browser and you can have a range of different accounts written down here. You'll have something like that similar if you have multiple accounts because you need to have different email addresses to hook into different learning management systems. And that's just a reality of how you couple the learning management systems. There are alternatives where campuses sometimes have what's called aliases. Uh, so they'll have one main account uh, that, that, and then they have an alias that's connected. Oftentimes the main account has some gibberish user ID or universal UID number or something like that. But then they have their their name, like my case, Delmar Larson at UC Davis EDU, And that would be connected to W82952 at UC Davis EDU, even though that's not correct. Um, the Several districts do that. Uh, Los Rios, for example, their faculty have six different email addresses, um, and it's unclear which ones are the ones that uh, learning man that that um, external identity providers like Microsoft and uh, Google will actually tell us exists. It's actually far more messy than we want it to be. Um, oh, so okay, thank you for that. But then, so my, then my question is, if I create a course, it in under one account, say for Pasadena City College, but I also want to use that course at East LA College. Is there a way to copy that course into the East LA account? Yeah. Uh, so in that case there, the best thing is the alpha beta thing that, that I was talking about before. You make one course that's your primary course and the second course that's tethered to it. Um, so assuming it's the same course that's operating the same way, except for deadlines and things like that. And then you can you can tether a beta course onto it across multiple. It doesn't matter which uh, campus you happen to be connected to it. That would okay, be helpful. thank you. That's how I'll, I I'll have to go to office hours to learn a little bit more about how to do that. Thank you very much. It's a little subtlety in order to have the same course across different campuses. Um, but that's what the alpha beta infrastructure is designed for doing. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> uh, uh, Nika, are you still having problems accessing the uh, the launch pad? No, I got there a different way, but the launch pad does not work for me, but I got there at one.libretext.org. That will also go. The launch pad should get you to the same uh, launchpad.libretext.org. What's that? Okay, I have something. Yeah, that's what I was getting. I don't know what but that is. I got there the other way. Um, that looks like it's a. Uh... I think there's just a typo. No N in Launchpad. You're right. I, L A U, L A U. In there we go. Yeah, I was able to get into it now. It was not working before. I don't know if maybe it was down or maybe my internet was having an issue. I don't know, but I'm I'm in. So okay, it's not so it's Launchpad. So someone, some company has gotten some um, 
stolen misspellings of it that I you just don't catch. Uh, the click on the link right there. That should be the right one that will go to uh, go to it. Um, right there. Yeah. So I'm not entirely sure what happened there. So, anyways. Um, <clears throat> If you have any questions or concerns with accounts, then we can take a look at it a little bit later on here, but I just want to move things forward a bit here. So <clears throat> here's the deal. Um, like I said, once you get into the account, uh, then you have access to everything that the Libreverse has, which we give you access to the libraries and most of these applications and the ones that we're working on integrating will like adapt will be there available. A bit. We'll be there soon. So anyways, <clears throat> we go to the conductor page. Uh, and this is the back end of the comments conductor. This is the project management tool. I just want to spend a few moments on here before we actually get started here. Uh, at the very top here, we have this bar here. We have the Launchpad uh, logo right there. Uh, we have the conductor uh, icon. If you click on the conductor icon, it will go to the top here. Um, then we have your home, which is essentially the same thing. You have my projects, which will give you all the projects that you are added to uh, that are not necessarily mine owned, you're not, uh, but you are part of the team that's connected to it. Analytics, if you have analytics that you want to have set up for reviewing the book. Uh, uh, support center, it's the same support center that we used for ADAPT. Uh, if you go to it, it will have the ability in order to, right now it's going to the, the back end of that, but if you, it'll go to something like this that you can actually contact and write in uh, these things. <clears throat> um, this is a toggle switch between the, Commons of the conductor. So basically flipping to the front end, to the back end, to the front end, because it's the same technology. Uh, and then we have uh, my name. Uh, if I have an avatar connected to my name, especially if I signed in at one time via uh, OAuth, oftentimes they connect it via Google. And I can sign there. <laughs> okay, so the conductor has three principal components. It has uh, uh, my avatar and a few additional things down below. Uh, I have control panel. You probably don't have control panel. Um, this is where you can submit alerts. This is where I said that if you come in and say you want to get notified if anything deals with uh, art and calculus, which is probably unlikely, any project, any book or any homework system, and I can create this thing. And now if anything comes in with those tags together, I will then get notified of that, which is again, highly unlikely. Uh, that's a very powerful approach in order to navigate through here. So um, <clears throat> uh, this is my support ticket. So if I submit to, to support, I can go to the tickets I have. This is a harvesting request. I used the term harvesting before, uh, and it refers to uh, the integration of existing OER that's off of our site and putting it into our site. Yeah. Uh, that's a process that can be easy or can be hard depending upon the nature of the material and the format in which we bring it in. Uh, but it's a convenient mechanism that if you know of existing OER that you want to make sure that you have access to in order to remix and work from, this is the first step in order to get that going. This is an adoption report. We'll keep track of individuals that have uh, uh, self-reported that they have adopted a book and give that information out to the author or the team of that book. This is if you need a verification request, if you're not verified, but in this case you are verified and this goes to the main site that we have. Okay. So <clears throat> in the middle is our projects. It's cut into two parts. One is the pinned projects, which you probably don't have anything pinned, but I have a lot pinned um, because I'm on thousands of projects for a variety of reasons. And then down below has the last six projects that I have edited or worked on just as a history uh, that's connected to that. Um, I'm going to go to the top here. And on the right-hand side has our announcements, uh, which includes the workshop that we are doing right now, um, and then introducing uh, Justin Shorb, who's a new member of our team, <clears throat> who is not here right now, um, uh, who's working on building a um, an effort that we're going to be talking about uh, in a few hours called the uh, LibreText Academy. Okay, so again, just to remind you, we can't build a resource without having a conductor page. So let's build a conductor page. So that green button right there is this create conductor project. That's what we're going to be clicking. Yeah. So if you click on that, it then creates the project. You can type in the name of that project, uh, Math 102, the Math of Love, 
which is a beautiful uh, topic for a book. I can decide if I want that to be public or private in the same way that I did before. I'm making it private because I don't uh, I, I don't want people to know about the project. It's kind of a joke project. And I create the project. And it creates the empty project. So I want you all to create an empty project right now. And give me a thumbs up when you've actually done that. Uh, I don't care about the title. Please make it private, though. I got a decent number that's up here. <clears throat> again, I know I said it several times. I'll say it again. We can't build a resource before we make a conductor page for it. So here is the conductor page, which again is a project management tool around building a resource. Now I use the term resource here instead of textbook because we can use conductor projects for doing a wide range of different things. Uh, we use it for building a textbook. We can use it for building ancillary materials. We can use it for organizing workshops, which is what we did for this one here, uh, where it, we would have some communication back and forth, which you've seen some uh, facets of this with, with the um, Oktoberfest workshop or Oktoberfest uh, conductor page. We can build communities of practice, which is similar to that. <clears throat> um, I use it whenever I want to organize uh, proposal constructions. It's just a project management tool that's convenient across the board. Yeah. So what does it look like? Well. Uh, right here, we have a thumbnail. It basically says that we're at the top of this project. It told me it, it successfully completed. This will go away in a moment here. If I want to pin that project to my page. I can do that, and that'll be one of the long lists that you have here. This is convenient if you have multiple projects um, and you want to be able to just pit the important ones, the ones that are topical right at the top um, there. I encourage you to do that if you desire. Okay, then we have this rainbow uh a line here that has a handful of different features. I want to go to that in a moment, but first I just want to show some of the basic principle or basic organization of the commons page. Um, so the first block right here is just basically metadata. It tells you some information about the nature of the project. If the project were harvested, we'd actually have some details associated here telling where it came from uh, with some external links. <clears throat> this is where we're going to be creating a book, which we're going to be doing momentarily. Um, if I have multiple people in the team, I will have a list right here. You saw that again with the Oktoberfest where you had about 100 different people on that list. Then we have three blocks. We have one for discussions. This is a thread infrastructure to facilitate communication. We have a nice little welcome introduction thing. We have a little progress, and this gives us the ability in order to basically have our communication put onto these threads. Using this instead of email is very convenient uh, for a variety of purposes. One is it keeps track of that information right there. Now, it makes it easier for you to be able to go back and review something that may be months or even years later. Now, it also makes it easier for other people on the team in order to come in uh, and not on the team, I mean in the development team in order to come in and review what the project is. So if you have a question that requires some assistance from the development team, we can come in and look at the project and see, okay, here's some details and this is what's going on and kind of get an idea behind that. Uh, I go, I'll pull up one in a moment in order to show you something in more detail. And la uh, second, we have assets that gives you the opportunity to upload things like a slide deck or other things that you can add directly into here. Uh, you also have the ability that once you add assets here, you can decide who gets to see access, who gets access to those resources. So you can make it so that only verified instructors have access, or you can make it so only people on the team have access um, uh, or everyone has access. You have a lot of control over how you want these assets to be shown. And lastly, we have tasks. Right now, these doesn't, don't have any tasks here, and this is better shown in a uh, something that... Let me go to this project here. This is the project page that I showed before. Um, again, this is a beginner healthcare uh, manual. They've been working on this for several years. We have some details connected to here with different people that are involved in the project. Here are some threads talking about progress. Here's some anatomy aspects that we were talking about, some project sites, other anatomy resources. It provides a mechanism to keep these things together in a convenient man a manner. Right. In this case here, they've uploaded a folder that's called the test bank, but there is nothing added to that test bank. Uh, 
but it gives you the opportunity to keep track of these things in a centralized manner. And then comes tasks, and the tasks right here uh, are organized in uh, based on chapters, but they can be organized in different fashions. For example, you can say one person handles the bibliography, one person handles this editing process, and one handles the enterprise, whatever it takes in order to make it move forward because it's your guys' projects. Um, and you can add people to that project um, or to that task specifically here, and they even have a thread connected to that or to have a more targeted conversation here. This is useful for not just a building books. When I, I use these conductor pages in order to handle my student team. So I have a team of about 100 to 150 students uh, over the last five years, and they each have their name entry here to keep track of what they're doing, what their progress is, and have a communication off of an essentialized manner, because I oftentimes just don't know what any one specific student's any, doing any one time, and I need to keep track of that. So there was a question that Sim has there, is there an upload limit to the conductor? Uh, there is a uh, there is no maximum limit in terms of what you can upload. However, there is a limit in terms of what you can upload at any one uh, click of the button. So if you want to upload files directly here, you have <clears throat> uh, a maximum of 100 megabytes uh, each, and you can go to uh, 20 files. Um, if you have videos, we don't like the videos to go longer than 30 minutes, preferably even uh, less. Um, and then you can just keep on uploading it as many times as you want um, and and such. So there you go. Uh, we have not encountered anyone abusing that, uh, uh, but we uh, if we do, we'll have to figure out some way in order to handle it. For example, about a decade ago, uh, we had some issues when our libraries were open for people to come in and store um, files as part of constructing books. We had it so anyone can actually construct uh, pages and edit pages at that time. It was an open wiki. Uh, and we had uh, individuals in India storing Bollywood films uh, on our site. Um, and probably as a mechanism, as a repository in order to distribute these things. And for several uh, weeks, we were going through cleanups of deleting and and locking out IPs and things. And then we ultimately decided to close it off and had more control over it. And that has made our lives a lot easier in terms of at least dealing with uh, those sort of issues. Uh, Lori has a, can you, uh, so you can't integrate a video that is more than, right now we have a 30 minute maximum. Uh, uh, we we can expand it uh, if there's an interest uh, for, for doing so. So the idea that we have is that the conductor page can, Conductor can act as a repository for videos and stream the videos just like YouTube. Uh, and it has that ability right now. So you can operate without having the YouTube issues. The two biggest issues are ads being added to videos. And the second one is uh, the uh, tracking uh, issues that they, you have out there. Uh, uh, you can always link out to a video. That's perfectly fine. You have someone else that actually hosts it uh, and such. And please, if this is a, a a barrier for you, just contact us and we can talk about working around it. We just want to have some natural limit off of here so people don't try to upload hours and hours of videos because it actually costs a reasonable amount of money for us to be able to do. Asima asked a question about auto captioning of videos available. When we upload a video uh, to the conductor, it automatically pushes that video to Whisper, which is a tool for, um, it's an AI tool for open AI that will automatically transcribe uh, the video making auto captioning. So it makes a VTT file. Um, and then that can be used for an entire transcript of the video and that's hosted there. So in other words, we ensure that we have auto graded capabilities. I will also mention that that same infrastructure is in place in ADAPT. So when you actually upload videos into ADAPT, which you can, especially in this technology of ADAPT that I didn't go over called Discuss It questions. That's basically like Flipgrid or VoiceThread uh, without obviously the financial buy-in for it. Uh, and and we automatically do that. Um, so does that override the auto text of, uh, of YouTube? Uh, YouTube does not let you uh, override their video transcripts uh, unless you own the transcript and you bring it in manually. So if you're taking someone else's video, you're stuck with their transcript or, or their automatic transcript, period. Um, you have no control over that. However, if you if it's your own video, you obviously have control over it on YouTube, or you can upload it to our platform, and then you have control over it directly. 
um, accessibility complex images to? Penny, that's a good question. Um, the uh, We don't have an infrastructure in place in order to automatically uh, describe videos. I know that there, that technology is still relatively new, um, and we're looking forward in order to take a closer look at that when we get it greater. We have more time. Sima further asking, can the auto caption be edited? Yes. Uh, and I have to take a look at what it looks like on uh, the conductor, um, but on the um, on adapt when you upload the video, then you have the ability to edit it. It turns out Whisper is actually very good, uh, and it can also be used in a variety of languages. Uh, we tested it quite extensively in Spanish, um, and from my understanding, only one edit was ever necessary in order to fix uh, that. But that's available to the individual that uploaded the video in order to, uh, to edit the uh, transcript if they so choose. Okay, so that was a, a little bit of a separate. Uh, diversion dealing with the video capabilities of a conductor. Uh, <clears throat> again, we did this because we didn't feel that YouTube was the best solution, long-term solution for what we wanted to be able to do. Uh, okay, um, so that is a standard conductor page. So this is the empty conductor page that I just established uh, right here. Um, I will admit that if it's just an individual person working on the, on the project itself, uh, you know, threads are not something that you typically will be using unless you want to use it to organize uh, material um, assets you may be able to do and such like that. So this is the conductor page. Now, we're going to be building a book. But before we build the book, I want to mention that when the book is published, which is when it's moved into our bookshelves, whether it's a campus bookshelves or the central bookshelves, it is then also added to our commons conductor, our commons, sorry, our commons page. Uh, so for example, any of these pages right here are formally added to the conduct, uh, the commons. Okay? We have lots of books that are under construction right now, some by our partners, some by ourselves, uh, our internal team, but when they're compiled, is when they actually move out and are live. So any of these projects, we come in here, and this right here is a commons page for the book. So you can think of it as the front end of the book that basically showcases a few things. Right here includes a summary. It gives us the table of contents. We can click on any of these things and go to the actual pages themselves. Some details associated with licensing, some details associated with um, uh, uh, go into the conductor project. That's the what we had created for there. If we're signed in, if you're not signed in, you don't get access to this. No. Or submitting adoption reports, reading online. We also have the ability in order to uh, act as an intermediary to a print on demand uh, system so that you can actually get a physical copy of that. Uh, uh, we basically take the cost, we add 16% in order to handle the cost associated with maintaining it. And you can get a physical copy of your book right there. For example, this book costs $15. My general chemistry book costs about $16 to $17 for my class. If the students decide that they want to have a physical copy, you can go about doing that. I encourage people in the workflow of building uh, books in order to construct a, uh, in order to get a copy of the book at one point, typically near the end. And then it provides opportunity in order to edit on the pages of the book and finds out that and many of us already know this, uh, is that the editing process of a physical page is very different than online. And this provides an opportunity in order to go through and typeset and, and do some major, major issues that you don't get uh, as well online. So anyways, <clears throat> um, back to, again, this is the commons page. Uh, this is only generated when the book is compiled. Uh, or right here, so again, Here's the book. Uh, now, like I mentioned to you, any conductor page can be used for creating a book or any other uh, resource. This is gonna be used for creating a book and you'll see a little green button here that says create page, book. Yeah. That's what I'm gonna be doing right now. I'm gonna click on that button. That's what I want you guys to do now. And that essentially is where it's gonna create an empty book. Uh, and I'm gonna put this somewhere, I'm gonna put this in biology and then I'm gonna create it. This will take a moment. Uh, I like you guys to do that right now. It doesn't, if you put it into a different library and you want to move it, that's also possible. Uh, but don't worry about which library it on is on. <clears throat> Most of you have editing rights on all the libraries, at least in what we call the workbench. Now, it's creating an empty book. 
uh, for us to be able to remix from, which is the first step that we're going to be doing before we start editing. And at that process, in that process, it creates this book in what we refer to as the workbench. And the workbench is just a community area uh, for building of our books before moving it into our campus. Uh, into the bookshelves. Now, you don't have access to move things into the bookshelves. You actually request us, our development team, in order to move it manually. At that time, we go through some review um, and change a few things and tweak a few things in order to make sure that it's actually up to snuff before we move it out there and such. Uh, so, uh, Carol says, you must choose a category which can't be changed. I'm not sure what that question is referring to. When I created a book, it, it wouldn't let me create it without choosing a category like biology, humanities, something like yeah, that. Yeah, the, li the library that it needs to fit into, yes. And then it says once you choose a, a category, you can't change it. Yeah, so, yeah okay. we can manually change it. It's just you okay. can't change it, that's all. Okay, got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, although there's no re reason for us to be able to, to stop that, we can introduce that flexibility off of there. Um, Julia asks, uh, it's telling me I don't have instructor access to that library. Uh, give me a moment, Julia. Uh, I, I will explain what that means. Actually, both of you have that. That button happens after you make this green, this button right here, right? Or is it during the process that you're creating your, your book? Okay. So in creating your account, uh, I have a feeling that we did not verify your account for all the libraries, which might be because uh, your account was not verified. So let me take a quick look here at being able to make sure that this is in place. Uh, uh, so your account is just not a verified account, that's all. Um, so we didn't go through the process of verifying these things. Um, so. Uh, Julia, you have to fit your book somewhere in the library. Uh, it, it Just like the Dewey Decimal System, it has to fit somewhere. We can move it somewhere else. So it sounds like a, a bunch of you did not have verified accounts, uh, which is causing some, con uh, uh, some issues. Uh, so... Um, I can verify accounts if they put their emails in the chat. There you go. Thank you. Uh, make sure they have access to all the libraries uh, while they're doing that. Um, <clears throat> uh, okay, so there was a question that popped up here, Nora. Will new libraries be created? Um, we've had some conversations about building new libraries. Um, uh, the, 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 at some point, we actually wanted to bring them all together into a single resource, uh, and then we can just branch off different parts of that library. Uh, we build the libraries based off of how much content we have on the libraries. So we didn't want to build a bunch of empty libraries uh, first. Each library is an independent operating wiki, which requires a bit of infrastructure to maintain. Uh, so the ones that are in Spanish, like the Espanol Library and the Akronskia Library and the Global Library, those are meant to be OER in another language. So for example, they're not meant to be Spanish as a second language uh, resource that's actually put in the humanities library. It's not that. Um, the, we've had some requests about AS, ASL. ASL is still relatively small on our platform. It's actually more developed on Adapt than it is on uh, on the library textbook itself. Uh, so uh, uh, there's a few questions here about a camp accounts that were not um, addressed appropriately. Uh, We'll go through a better workflow in order to make sure that all accounts were also created in an appropriate manner. Okay. Um, okay. So while uh, these accounts, if you have if you have issues off of that, then uh, please uh, write them down in the chat, and Jennifer can actually address it, so I can continue on off of here. So Carol asks, "Is there's no ESL library? Uh, it's in the humanities library under language." Uh, no, 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 sorry. It's in the social sciences library under education. I think. Uh, I'm Now I'm starting to... Uh, starting to forget exactly where it happens to be. Counseling is under social sciences. 
Uh, and for the sake of this conversation, it doesn't really matter um, greatly where it happens to be uh, because we will be able to remix uh, anywhere that's out there. Uh, but I understand that's convenient in order to be able to try to find where these things happen uh, to fit. Uh, and I'm just trying to, a quick look here. Uh, I'm actually pretty sure that ESL is not under language. Actually, it is. It's under English as a second language. Um, so, uh, I understand that there are different structures that people would have at different points. So they'd organize it in different ways, but this is uh, sort of how things have grown organically, uh, partially as a function of um, uh, having enough material in order to be able to support individual libraries or support individual uh, sections of libraries. And if you feel that you have a better uh, uh, structure behind it, please let us know. Uh, we're quite open to uh, placing things in different ways. And we get feedback from all the time from community about how they'd like to have things structured, especially in specific fields that we are not subject matter experts for. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, okay. So let's get back uh, to this issue here. Uh, for those of you that were able to create the textbook link, uh, and those that were unable to will be able soon once Jennifer actually completes that. In fact, this green button, which was to create the textbook, then creates an empty textbook, uh, creates a link. So if I click on the link, it will go to the actual book itself in the book, in the workbench. Now, this is where we have uh, one step that is a little, uh, requires a little bit of finesse uh, for, and that is um, while I'm signed into the conductor page, and for those of you that didn't have fully verified accounts, who will be soon, uh, <clears throat> uh, this is the book that was created. Uh, I need to make sure that this gray bar right here turns black. Uh, and right now it's gray. If it's gray, it means I'm not signed in to this specific library. If I click on sign in, it will grab the credentials that I'm signed in from the conductor page and then automatically bring me in. And we're working on ways in order to make this more automatic uh, for you. But the key point is that if this bar up here, once this actually uh, loads up, if this bar is not black, then you don't have editing rights. Yeah. It's exceedingly important because you're unable to remix, you're unable to edit, you're unable to do lots of stuff. If it's gray, you can't do it. If it's black, you have editing rights uh, for. Yeah. So I want to make sure that everyone first... Once you've created the book, you click on the button and that you then now can confirm that you have a black bar here. If you don't have a black bar here, let me know or let us know in the chat. Uh, that would be uh, after clicking the button, the sign in button, and it would be suggested that your account does not have the credentials in order to sign into the biology library or the library where you host your book. Um, uh, Veronica, do you think you can click on the button? Uh, Emily, you're, oh, let me log out. It should be sign in right here. Let me see here. It should have this, actually, it's now trying to sign me in. Like everything's trying to remember, uh, remember it. Elizabeth, if you are signed into your conductor page and you have a, you have account here, you should be able to access this. So you want to click the sign in button here on the gray bar. I did that. And then I attempted to sign in using the credentials that I thought I needed and it failed. So obviously I need to try something else. If you're signed, if you're signed in the conductor page, Oh, I've been second. I've been following along. Is it possible that it it timed me out or something because I've been signed in? No, we we have a timeout on twenty four hours, so it shouldn't be a problem. Hold on one second here. And I'm having the same issue.
Okay, Carol asks, can you change the name of the book once it's been created? Uh, I, uh, not easily, not right now, but you can change it once it's published uh, at the process off of there. So you just need to be able to let us know. Uh, and that's for a variety of purposes, at least right now, uh, but that limitation is gonna be uh, removed sometime soon. Uh, Emily, I'm giving you credentials. You didn't have credentials on all your libraries. So hopefully now you should be able to sign in in order to be able to do that. Uh, the uh, Veronica, you're in. Looks like Jennifer's handling that stuff. If anyone still doesn't have problems getting that black bar, uh, please make sure you paste it into the chat and Jennifer is able to handle that. Again, without that black bar, you're not going to be able to remix uh, or edit effectively. Uh, so um, right now I'm signing in. This again takes a moment because the cast system is a little bit slower. <clears throat> um, and this right there, but where was my book? I think I did it in biology, not social sciences. Nika asks, how important is that we place things in the correct library? It's not really that important, to be honest, uh, because once you actually compile it, uh, once we move it into a bookshelf somewhere, uh, uh, then it gets compiled and you're able to do a search through the, the cataloging system uh, in order to find the book uh, across all libraries. So it doesn't really matter necessarily where it happens to sit. So you can think of this as the card catalog that tells you where it happens to be and you're able to get through it. Uh, although I understand some people would like to have certain things in different areas. There's also interdisciplinary topics that is, it's unclear exactly where it needs to sit. And this provides a mechanism in order to uh, just show you a, a snapshot of where it happens to be. And so, um, <clears throat> okay. So, Um, Elizabeth signing in is uh, is associated. Um, were you able to? Con I'm sorry. The, the 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 issues that you were talking about here of signing in. Um, and the credentials here, are the same credentials, and in getting into the conductor page. And so they're, they are the same infrastructure for doing so. So if you're able to get into the conductor project with the same credentials that should be saved in your memory, it should work because it's the same system. It's not any separate system in place. Um, so please take a closer look at it. But if you're in your conductor page, your browser already remembers it in the cookies and it should be able to bring it in unless you switch to a different Okay, so let's move this thing forward a little bit um, and um, um, Elizabeth, I'm not, uh, give me, actually, Jennifer, do you think you can handle Elizabeth? Um, maybe if it doesn't work, uh, go into a breakout room in order to try to get them uh, sign in. Um, yeah, I, I, I need her email. Okay. Okay. Uh, like I said, it's the same credentials. That they they are. It's the same system completely. Um, okay. So where are we? Um, I have a project. Uh, it's down here. How to? Let me refresh where that project happened to be because I just. I gotta find what my project was, which was something dealing with cats. Is that right? Math love. The math of love. Oh. Um, this takes a little bit of time because I have lots and lots of projects. You don't have this time. It's just as going through and uh, doing this uh, this search. Let me see if I have it in my. Here we go. So here's my project. Uh, this is what. Everybody, does anyone have any problems getting to this level? Okay, so here it is. Uh, when I'm signed in, this is a black bar, uh, and there's a little blue button here that says go to the conductor project. So if you ever go to your book and you want to go to the conductor project, the back end uh, of your commons a conductor in order to uh, view what you're doing here, you can click on this and again goes to that page there. It's taking a while to load up right here. Yeah. <clears throat> so 
here's uh, a an empty book that's created in the workbench. Okay, this is the structure that's very similar to the other structures of the libraries. We have an icon right here. I'll talk about reader mode a little bit later on. This right here has a few additional options. Some of these buttons are going to go away. If you have it in the engineering library, they're already gone. Uh, uh, the we'll talk about editing later on. This right here is the bookshelf. Uh, sorry, not bookshelf. The breadcrumbs. And then we get into the actual book itself, the structure that we have in place here. So it has a front matter, it has a back matter, and it has a, an empty chapter in the middle. If you go under contents here, you can actually see the table of contents for the book itself. So the front matter has four pages in it, title page, info page, table of contents, and licensing. These are uh, necessary for every book that we have compiled in our book itself. In the back matter, we have an index, a glossary, and a detailed licensing infrastructure. And then the middle is just an empty uh, chapter right here. <clears throat> so this is all fine and dandy. We're already logged in. We're ready to go. I'm going to go to my conductor page for my book. And under more tools, there's the option of the OER remixer. Now, again, the OER Remixer is a graphical user interface in order to capitalize on the existing corpus of content that we have and be able to drag them and drop them in order to create a book within seconds to minutes. Uh, and that's what we're going to pull up here. So if I click on the OER Remixer that's in the conductor page itself, it will pull up the Remixer and it will load up the book uh, automatically into it. And it will look something like this. If you're not logged in, if this is not a black bar, it will come up with um, demo mode or something like that here, which is not what we want. So I want everyone to pull up the remixer again by going to more tools and the OER remixer under the project for your book. The intent of that is to integrate as many of the tools that you're going to be using for building, customizing and updating your book within this project uh, tool. Uh, project page in order to keep it as a centralized infrastructure, a centralized tool chest for you in order to be able to use. So I just need some thumbs up to tell me that you guys have the remixer loaded up uh, with your book ready to go. You got a few thumbs. Emily looks like that. She's good. That's great. Deborah, uh, can you contact, uh, can you put your email address into here? Your account is set as a student account, not as a instructor account. More tools is the purple button right here under your conductor page, Marty. Jennifer, can you take a look at Deborah's account to see if we can uh, put it into an instructor account? Yep. Thank you. Uh, Marty, were you able to find the remixer? Good. Okay. So here's the remixer. Uh, and the remixer is a relatively simple technology. Uh, Simi, I think you're going a little bit further than, than we want to go right now. Hold on a second here. Um, uh, Elizabeth, we're going to be taking a break between remixing and editing. I'd like to take a closer look at your uh, credentials in order to get in. Okay, so here's the book. Uh, here's the remixer. And the uh, remixer is relatively simple. On the left side is the library panel. You're only going to see the first three. You're not gonna see these other ones. I see these other ones because I'm logged in as my account instead of my demo account. Uh, so they're right here. And on the right-hand side is my book, the book that I've created. That's about it. Up here, you have a few additional features. You're not gonna see this copy default mode because only I see that. You'll have your name here um, and then you'll have some remixer options right there. Um, that's off of that. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, ignore these remixer options because they're relatively simple and just want to show what you're going to be using the remixer 99, 95% of the time. And it's largely dragging and dropping. Uh, so <clears throat> this is the book here. This is the library. I'm going to go to and find a page or a chapter that I want to be able to do. So I'm going to grab, go through the bookshelf, go to ecology, 
go to a book in ecology like Radicalize the Hive. And all I need to do is to click on one of these chapters of this book. I'm going to click the button and I'm going to drag it over here. I'm going to put it somewhere I want it, like right below first chapter. And then that's that. And that's the most of what we're going to be doing is to drag and drop things from the library panel into the remix panel. <clears throat> so at this point here, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what's being done here. Yeah. So what we're doing here is we're organizing the book on the right hand side by either dragging things over or we can even work within the structure in order to rearrange and reorganize this book. Now, it looks like that we're doing this for the book itself, but we're really not. We're doing it on the remixer, and we need to save to the server in order to push it to the server. It's just like writing an email. You write an email, click a button, and you send it off. Uh, it's the same process. You create your book, you rearrange your book, and then you press the save to server in order to do so. Yeah. So I'm just going to show you uh, doing it here. Uh, click to save to server. It actually has it's a two-step process. I need to save to server twice. This is because it gives me an overview of what's going to be done. So when I press save to server, it's going to make two new pages. It's going to rename some pages. It's going to not affect four pages. And I click here, and this, pro and this process is done. Well, it'll be done in a moment. Uh, and that right there is essentially the that step of drag, save to server, and then done is what most of the remixing is put together. Once you've done that, you can then revise, which is basically reload the current textbook. And there's the book again. And I can continue the process. And this is what I want you to be able to do. But before we do that, I just want to talk about two things, and then we'll start dragging off here. One thing is that this is the book. The things that are red are black, uh, are existing pages in our book. If you have a plus mark, you can expand in order to see what's below it. <clears throat> and that's fine and dandy. If I don't want uh, a page, if I want to delete a page, I can click on here and do the delete button and it will delete the page. Of course, it will only delete the page once I save to the server because I haven't saved to the server here. So if I click on save to the server. It will tell me it will delete one page. If I want to, I can even expand and see what page it will be deleting. I press save to the server and it will delete that page. The remixer is the preferred mechanism in order to create pages, to delete pages, and to restructure your book, in addition to obviously remixing. So it's deleted that page. I can revise the current page. And here we go. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so, um, so that's the basic process. Now, that was red. If I want to click this plus button here, for example, I'm going to click on first chapter. It's going to make a new page underneath it. So when it was red and, and a strict mark like this, it will delete the page. When it's green, it will make the page once we save to the server. And once it's orange, it means it's changing something. Now, if you were paying attention here, you saw that this thing here changed from two to one. Chapter two to chapter one. And that's because we have the auto number set up. The auto number is designed in order to make your life a lot easier. So that you can rearrange things and it will automatically change the, the number for the sections and the chapters depending upon the order that you put things together. So it's convenient in order to be able to restructure things and not worrying about how to type everything, renumber everything automatically. Moreover, if the question, if the uh, content on the pages are designed properly, uh, as they uh, were harvested appropriately, as you change the number right here of your chapter, it will also change all the equation numbers, the figure numbers, and the table numbers accordingly to reflect that number right there. So you rearrange these things in order to make it so your life is easier in order to build your book and not dealing with all the details and numbers of uh, issues of, oh, you're changing this thing number and this number here and this number here and type of thing. Uh, so uh, there were a few questions off of here. Uh, one was uh, by Carol. Uh, so when you add that page, it was a new chapter, not part of a chapter one. Uh, <clears throat> so the actual idea of what is a a chapter and a section here is based off of our structure. Uh, so this follows a, right now it's following a traditional textbook structure.
structure of a book consisting of chapters, consisting of sections or pages. And that's about it. But of course, we know that we ha can have books where we have units of multiple chapters or we have subsections of pages. Uh, that right there is not canonical, uh, although you can still certainly organize in that way. But that causes some issues if you try to bring the book into your learning management system via common cartridge. Because some learning management systems don't like non-canonical structures. For example, Canvas only takes two levels, chapters, sections. That's it, period. So if you have subsections where you have multiple chapters, we have to rearrange the book in order to make it so Canvas is able to understand how it works. That's just a limitation associated with Canvas. Um, <clears throat> so uh, in regard to your question, it was a new chapter, not part of chapter when you added that page. Yeah, so I can actually add things in a variety of structures however I want. So for example, if I want to go to botany and horticulture, uh, and I get this inanimate light. So this right here is a book. This right here are chapters. And this right here uh, has a section. So I can come in and I can drag this section here and pop it right here under first chapter. So what was 2.4 then becomes 1.2. I can move it up above 1.1. So now it flips around. If I want to, I can deactivate the auto number. And now if I bring this over here, it will keep it with the same number that's there. So it's convenient if I don't want the auto number on, although, 95% of the time I have the auto number on because it makes life convenient for me. Uh, so I can click on that, but just uh, flick it there. Now it changes the, the number. <clears throat> so hopefully I addressed your question, Carol. Uh, so, I mean, you can also bring in the whole chapter right there. What was chapter two is now chapter one. Chapter two now is back to what it was with chapter originally two. Now, instead of being orange is black because I'm not changing it if I were to save it. And then it creates these new pages there. And I'm going to save to the server off of here. Now, before I let you guys go uh, and start remixing, uh, I just want to mention a little bit about the remixing process. Oh, wait, there's Nora's question here. And then we go to create scratch your, uh, your own textbook. You need to get into remix. It's a good idea to use the remixer also for building empty pages that you're going to be populating things. So use it as a reorganizer, not just basically as a remixer. Um, and that's the preferred mechanism for doing so. In fact, the other mechanism that we have that's manual will be going away very soon. <clears throat> so, um, you know, and, and it's bringing in 67 pages. So it takes a moment in order to be able to pull this in. What do you think is the biggest issue with remixing? Well, it's not actually building or remixing or pulling pages in and just so you can drag and drop a relatively easy in order to build your book. The biggest issue is that you have a 1.2 million pages of content. Uh, how do you actually find the content that you want? And this is where it, it requires a bit of searching uh, and a bit of looking at uh, browsing of uh, books that are similar. Uh, to what you want to do and just basically organizing your thoughts or your structure behind that. So uh, the the um, uh, before we actually start remixing, it's a good idea to have a game plan. Basically saying, yes, you can remix anything, but it's a good idea to know what books and what chapters do you want to use in order to build your remix? And it's best in order to do that via what I call a remixing map. So this is an example of a remixing map. And it, it can provide a lot. I like to use this example right here. So the link was at the top of the remixer right here, your remixing map. And it pulls up this page of building remixing map. A remixing map is just something that's written down to tell you what page from what book do you want to bring into what chapter of what page in your book? That's all. It's a map to say how does stuff here gets remixed off of here. Um, so, uh, so give me one second, Cindy, to finish this and I can get back to uh, addressing your, your question. <clears throat> so this is a remixing map made by Lubbock Christian University. It's actually a pretty good remixing map. Um, it's more detailed than what I would do because uh, I it doesn't matter what format it is. This can be digital. Could be a piece of paper, could be toilet paper, it doesn't matter. Its utility is zero uh, once you've remixed, uh, then it has no use anymore. Uh, so in this case here, they're building an introductory chemistry book. 
that that introductory chemistry book is in yellow. So it's actually two columns here, chapters one to chapter 14. There's some things missing down below here. Uh, chapter one, they have 10 sections, uh, numbered 1.1 to 1.10. Uh, and they say that the first section they want to remix from this TRO text map called the scope of chemistry. Fine. The second one they want also from that same book. Fine. The third one, 1 1.3, they want to take from 2.5 of that book. Why do they want to do it? Because it better suits their needs. Uh, this is what uh, remixing allows you to do, is to build what you want, not what someone else has created for you. Mm -hmm. Then you say 1.4 is now 2.1. You know, I'll get all the way down here. Now chapter 2, their 2.1 is now 4.1. And you can see that it changes numbers to 6 and 17 and a little bit of 4, 9, and 10, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So they scrambled around. This right here is a map. And once you, you can use this to create your remix by dragging and dropping and saying, okay, I want to do this. I want to structure it all relatively straightforward. And you save it and then it creates your book. So the actual process of remixing, using the remixer, in the whole scheme of things is a relatively small part of remixing. The bigger part is to know what you want to remix from. And I presume right now you don't have that game plan in building your book. Although you may have an idea that you want to follow some existing book. Like for example, you may want to say, I like the OpenStax book, but I really want to change this, change this, add this, delete this, etc. Because no faculty member is 100% happy with the textbook that they had, at least the traditional way. They want to add something, they want to subtract something. Remixing gives you the ability to do that. So um, <clears throat> again, you don't have to think about this right now because we don't have time in order to do so, but it's a very important thing in order to be able to, uh, to grab and run with it. So you can see that this book is created. If I want to click on this button to look at it, it's another mechanism to look at my book. It looks like this. Uh, and you can see it has two sections, one very long section dealing with organisms and the other one dealing with not even chapter and it has front matter, black matter, etc. Now, I'm going to revise this, reload this basically in the remixer. If I double click on any of these pages, I will pop up a properties. And the properties gives me the ability in order to change things. Organisms and love. It's a very good uh, title for this chapter. And this one here, uh, my first love. Her name was Brenda. Um, and we'll pop that down right there. <clears throat> so it gives me the ability to come in and say, well, I really don't want this new page. And I really want this to be restructured up here and this structure up here. And you'll notice that as this does this, it changes the, makes these things orange because I'm changing the numbering. So it gives me an indication about what to expect when I actually save to the server, that it's behaving in the way that I want it to behave. Uh, so pay attention to the colors uh, and making sure that it follows what you expect it to do when you're doing these things. I saved a server. It gives me the information that one page will be deleted, 11 pages will be renamed, 55 pages will not be affected. And then I just cycle through here. So the process that we're doing here is essentially, and we have a failed uh, delete, which happens from time to time. Um, we just have to delete it again. <clears throat> and the new version of the remixer will actually uh, remove those little uh, farts. <clears throat> so we are getting into a cycle here that eventually results in remixing. We're going to get to editing, then remixing and editing, remixing, remixing, maybe rearranging, uh, editing, and you keep on cycling through the process uh, through this skill set and the other skill set we'll be talking about um, later on this hour in order to generate a final product that you're happy with. Once that cycle is done, which I actually argue you're never done, but once it's done enough that you want to take it out of the workbench and put it into the bookshelf so other people can see it and it can be used as catalog and things like that, that's when you notify us uh, and you give us a, an email that says basically, I'm ready to go, please uh, move it over and we move it over with some review and things like that. Um, and I'll talk about some of the things that we check uh, when we talk about the um, skills that we use in editing uh, a little bit later on. So 
what I want you guys to do is to take your book and I want you to bring in two chapters of some book that you like, preferably you like. And, uh, and if you can't find a book that you like, then grab a book that you don't like, uh, whatever chapter that you bring in. Uh, if you want to go to a different library, you can click on this button right here and go to one of the other libraries in order to pull from like work, uh, like statistics. And I feel statistics are important for my remix. I can flip around in order to be able to do that. So that's the first thing. The second thing that I want you to be able to do is after you've brought it over, I want you then to uh, rearrange uh, the structure, move one chap, one section into a different spot in the book, um, then save it. And the last one I want you to do is to be able to delete one of these things and then saving it. And those are the three things I want you to be able to do right now. And I can address some of the questions that are in the chat while we're working on that. That is your homework. So uh, I'll start at the top, which uh, Nora asked about from scratch. And I was suggesting that, yes, if you want, uh, it's, if you want to build a book completely from scratch, you can build an empty infrastructure here of just basically making pages up. Uh, uh, over and over again in order to build the structure. And then you can go in and edit it. And that's the second part of what we are doing here. This is remixing, which is using existing material as you bring it up. Um, so uh, Karen asked, uh, will the next session go over more advanced features like forking and editing the content here? I'll talk about forking after this, since we have a hand, we have a little bit of time before we take a break, uh, and, and just in order to make sure people understand that, because that's critical in terms of editing uh, content. Um, Cindy asks, I'm, uh, I miss going to create a book to remixer. Um, <clears throat> Cindy, if you didn't catch it, um, once you've created the book, once this is blue, you can then access the remixer right here under the more tools area. Were you able to get to that? It still says demo. Uh, is this bar right here black for you? Okay, so it should say sign in right here. Uh, can you click on that button and sign in? It uses the same credentials as the Commons and Conductor because it's the same technology. Then you're going to be able to remix. You could still remix with the demo account. You just can't save it to the server. So you can only save it to a file, uh, uh, <clears throat> which in some cases may be useful. Uh, in order to be able to share the book and then share the the file itself, uh, but most of the time I recommend just editing directly on the uh, the server itself. This is useful. Um, well, for you, we'll just leave it like that. Okay. Jamie asked, "Is there no mechanism to create a remixing map? We don't have a mechanism to create uh, uh, a remixing map. We we looked at that process a long time ago uh, to facilitate uh, it." Uh, but we uh, we were unhappy with the results. Uh, it just was more clunky than what we wanted. So we figured it was best to let the people decide what you want to do. Personally, I use a piece of paper uh, and then I just basically write it down and it's much faster than having to go through and building it uh, using that Excel form or any other structure that's out there. Um, so you can conceivably on one page review the book and remix at the same time. So you're building the remixer kind of as you're going. The one thing to mention here is, like I said, it's a cycle. So if you remix and you don't like it, just remix again and delete and edit and process and just do this process as you see fit. Um, okay, so Penny asked about author attributions. Um, that's actually part of uh, part of uh, transclusion, and I will address that because we have a fairly detailed infrastructure in place for auto attributions. Uh, Lori asks how to add a chapter, or you, if you're asking about how to add a empty chapter, uh, you can basically just press the ch uh, right now. I'll go to the top page and I just press a where are we here? A plus mark, and then just makes an empty chapter right there. Now, of course, I need to save to the server in order to make that be generated in my book and not just on my personal computer. Um, and then I can come in and I can make so many pages underneath that chapter. I can club, come in and, and re rename this thing however I like uh, and such. 
hopefully I addressed your question, Lori. If not, please uh, chime in again. Elizabeth asked, I would like to remove some activities from a LibreText. I like, so when you say activities, uh, Elizabeth, are you referring that you want to edit the pages, on, edit the content on the page? Yes. Okay. That's the next step that we're dealing with. So right now, the tools that we're dealing with is remixing and editing. And this is akin to using a computer where <clears throat> you are using the operating system, like Windows and such, in order to manipulate the files. You're structuring the files and tables and in folders and things like that. But when you want to edit the content of the files, you use a different tool in order to be able to pull it up. It's the same thing here. Organizing the structure of the book is a different tool than editing the content on the pages in the structure of the book. Uh, um, and that's why we split this thing up into remixing and editing as two separate tools. Um, okay, it looks like Cindy is cool again. When I select text and press save to server, it doesn't get saved. It's a two-step process, Carol. You press save to server, and then down here, you press save to server again. Carol, did you do both of those? Are you talking to a different Carol? I didn't ask that. Carol question. Wu, sorry. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and the reason for that is that you're going to be doing a bunch of stuff here and wants to make sure you understand what you're doing here because it's difficult uh, to revert after you're doing because you're rearranging things, you're deleting a whole bunch of doing a whole lot of stuff uh, and behind here. <clears throat> uh, so we want to make sure that you're, it's, it's clear. So if you think you're just editing something, uh, but yet it says, you know, 200 pages are being deleted, you may not want to save. You may want to look carefully about why is it going to delete 200 pages uh, when it's processed. It's that warning step in order to be able to have you review it before you actually start uh, forward uh, with that. So let's see here. Cindy's looking for a particular book that you don't see under humanities. Um, if you go to the, the, the commons, and you do a search through it. If it's a if it's a compiled book, that will do a search over every library across the board. Um, I think I got you, Margaret. If I didn't, please let me know. Uh, Nika asks, "What if the remixer reads? Remixer suggests changes to two pages. What that means? Um, I think you're talking about. Actually, I'm not entirely sure what you're talking about here. I uh, saved it. I saved it." Um, mm -hmm. And I saved it again, and then I went and viewed it again so that I could make another change to it, like you asked. Uh -huh. And it popped up and it said, oh, here's all these changes. It says, Remixer suggests changes to two pages. It looked like for some reason it wanted to change. It, it had them in yellow, but there was no change that I could see to them. So I was just curious if that meant something or if maybe it was just a weird well, we thing. We do, have a, we do have something that's set up in order to, to tell you if you're not uh, following a canonical structure. Uh, to, not... To not on this page, on the actual a... remixer page. Yeah, that page. When I reloaded it to that page, that's where it popped up at the top. Um, ignore it for now. D okay. Don't, don't worry about it. I can, I can do uh, <clears throat> Okay, Nika, can you show where to click after? It's in the lower uh, left-hand button. So you go over your upper right to the lower left. It requires a yeah, little- Yeah, no, bit. no, I, I, I oh. saved down there. Where do I go after it saves? Oh, the, the, if you want to go back to, if you want to pull up the book again, you can revise. Mm -hmm. Or if you want to look at the book, you could do this. Okay. When I clicked revise, it told me I was doing something weird. I think it hadn't saved all the way. Thank you. Yeah. You want you want to have this finish. We probably need to put a loop off of here. We're going to be revamping the remixer. It's been on our plan for the whole year in order to uh, update it to a more modern um, code base because code changes quite rapidly. Uh, and this is about five-year-old code. Um, and we can actually update and, and handle a few things and make it a, a more integrated fashion. I'll probably make it a bit faster too. Okay, so um, Carol asked, when I moved my chapter to my book, it made it part of chapter one instead of creating a new chapter. Okay, so that has to do with how you actually moved it into your, your book here. So if you drag something overlapping a a page here. So each one of these things is a page. So if I want to grab this chapter here and overlap right here, it will actually add it to that page. So what I did is I took chapter two and I made it into chapter two, but now it makes it into a third level. So this is not a two level system, a chapter 
page level, this now has a chapter inside of a chapter. Now, is there a reason for doing that? You may feel it is a reason for doing that. But if you want, you can grab it and just drag it up. And instead of having it in there, you see where this thing is uh, marked right there? Um, I can actually move above in between it and then it just moves it up there. Yeah. Alternatively, if I put it at the top of the book, it will have the same effect of bringing it down below right down here. So, so I guess that's my question to add a chapter because when I brought over a chapter, just made it, I put it under chapter one. I tried, I put it above back matter, but it still made it part of chapter one. So, you know, I'd already moved chapter one in. And then when I tried to move chapter two in, it put it in like part of chapter one is what I'm trying to say. You should be able to drag it back out again, just like what I just did. So okay. nothing, nothing here is fixed at all. You can you can drag them out and move them however you want. This goes okay. into chapter two. This goes between chapter one and two. This goes to chapter one. This goes between the two. This goes to here uh, and such. You should be able to drag and drop. Okay. It's not going to delete anything. Just uh, try to play and move with it. Uh, if you like, we can take a screen and take a closer look at it. Okay, thanks. Mm. Okay. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's very specific where the mouse is and where you're structuring it in terms of how you're building this thing. Yeah. Alternatively, we would not have a graphical user interface. We would have like buttons in order to structure things around. That's how Pressbooks does. But we found that to be a little clumsy and we wanted to be able to have better control in order to rapidly build the structure up here. But it requires carefully paying attention to the, where that cursor button is to tell you where this is going to be going. Cindy, you said you don't see the remix panel. You don't see this. That may mean that you're not loaded up. It didn't load up the book. Um, so if you go to, if you pull up the remixer in your conductor page, it will pull up the book. We used to have the ability that you can control any book and pull up anything, uh, but we uh, limited that, but we haven't fully gutted the, re-gutted re the technology in order to be able to uh, remove that ability. So, Nora, I tried deleting some pages first before saving to the server. Is this okay to do? You can do anything you want to your book. It's your book. Uh, you can, uh, I typically, there's no reason for you to create a page and then to delete the page. Um, you can just as easily um, delete it before it saves it. And it will have the same effect. It won't make a red mark because it doesn't delete anything. It just doesn't create it, is the point. Laura asks, can you ask URL from a library for something you already selected? Uh, Lori, are you asking, can you remix using a URL of the page that you want to remix from? Is that the question that you're asking for? I have never done it in that way. I'm not sure if it can. I guess it will work that way. You can you can paste, make an empty page and paste the source right here. And I think it will create it uh, once you save to the server. Um, I have never checked that out, uh, to be honest, because it's never been something that I've done. But uh, it's... Not necessarily an unreasonable workflow if that works for you and this works uh, appropriately here. I'll wait a moment for it to actually come up to confirm. Jamie asks, uh, is anyone else making my mistakes? Don't add too many pages because it takes a while. It, um, it will always take a while because it needs to create a page in the database and and tweak a few meta tags and things like that. Um, I'm gonna see if this thing actually pulled up. It did. So that's that did paste in exactly that uh, that page when we did that. So thank you for bringing that up to me. Um, it, it will take a while in order to, especially if you're doing hundreds and hundreds of pages. Uh, and that's just the, the time it takes in order to be able to process that. Uh, Nora asked the question, sorry if you already explained this, but after saving the chapters, a few pages appear yellow orange. What's that mean? If it's yellow orange, it means uh, when you when you save it, it will change the title. 
in some way. Typically, it's associated with the auto number if you actually rearrange things because the numbering might change on the title. So so for example, here we go. If I move this thing up to here, it will change the title of that one uh, from 2.2 to 2.3, and this was 2.3 to 2.2. So the orange just tells you that it's going to be changing the color code, oh, changing that once you're done. You can see it right here. And they'll say, you know, it'll give you a better breakdown. How many will be moved? How many will be renamed? And how many will even have meta tags changed on that? You don't need to worry about the details behind why that's the case because we just don't have time in order to do so. Um, so... Josiah did a lot of pages. That was super fun. That made no sense. I'm not sure if I should say way to go or I'm sorry, um, but uh, it seems like you have a better understanding of it. Yeah, you don't make thousands of pages. In fact, I think we do have a maximum number of pages that you can save at any one time, um, but it's it's like 500 or 700 or something like that. Um, uh, <clears throat> Or maybe, maybe it's like 1.5 thousand or something like that, because uh, some books can get really big. Okay, uh, I asked you, uh, Nora, did I answer your question uh, to your satisfaction? Looks like Elizabeth also uh, gave a similar response. Okay. Yes, you did. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Marty asked, if book appears in the bookshelf panel to remix, but when I look for it in the comments, it's not there. Uh, so for things to be in the commons, they need to be compiled. And sometimes there are some books that are in the bookshelf that are not compiled, but it, it happens rarely. Uh, so for example, if, if something is in the process of being uh, addressed, then we can take a look at that. Uh, you're mentioning some interactive calculus, Q1. I'm not sure. Do you know where that's at? Uh -oh. or, yeah. Okay, so it's in the bookshelf. Calculus. Um, so I don't know the state of affairs for that book. That book was not compiled. Um, so there must be a reason why. Yeah, that's the one. So yeah, but I was trying to look actually view it. And so that's where I was trying to go to the comments to view it in a separate screen, but I couldn't find it. Well, this one is compiled, so this should be in the comments. Maybe I'm typing something. I just can't find it in the comments, so I can view it, but I'll work on it. Um, huh. I'll, I'll take a closer look at, uh, and I don't know why it's not there. We have Q2 and Q1, but it should, it should be there. Um, uh, I'll take a closer look at that. Anyways, um, thank you. <clears throat> can you change the title of the book? You can change the title of the book when it's time for, uh, uh, currently you can change it only when we uh, uh, publish it, when we take it out of the bookshelf. Uh, so when you when you request it to be moved, you can request the title to be changed. Similarly, if you want to change it to a different library, you need to ask us in order to do the, the grunt work on you for on the, our backside. And Nika asked, I tried to add a learning object. It showed up just fine in the remixer and saved. It's okay. I, I It's okay. I figured it out. It didn't save. It said it did, but it didn't. And when I reloaded it again, it worked. Okay. Um, Penny's asked, look, and contributors cannot be remixing. You can't remix the same book at the same time because it will be crazy. It's not designed in order to facilitate that. We've never had that problem. Um, we do have it with editing and it will actually give you a notification that says that you have actually edited, that you're at, ed you're editing a page simultaneously with someone else. And it's not designed for simultaneous editing, not like, uh, Google docs, for example, most systems are not designed that way, even though it's a nice, uh, nice feature. It's just pretty painful in order to implement. Um, um, how do I get back to editing it? What it's in the, um, I can just see like front matter, chapter one, chapter two, back matter, like four squares. Like, I'm sorry, let me put my video on so you can see what I'm doing. I can see four squares, you know, yeah. front matter, chapter one, chapter two, back matter, but I can't see, um, I, uh, yeah, I'm there. How do I go back to edit it and change like 
put my ch exchange chapter one or you know okay so you want to go back to the remixer and uh, how do i do that you, know, you, sh you should have a, a a the remixer opened up in a different panel but if you uh -huh. don't you can click on the conductor project the blue yeah. button, and that way they will pull up your your conductor page and then you can pull up the remixer Oh, got it. Okay. Okay. I probably, there'll be, I have there'll be additional tools here, uh, like making PDFs and a few other things like that, and or make this a bigger um, uh, tool chest for you to access. So it makes sense why it's actually all bringing together. It's just a slow process for us to update things in the new new pro new mechanism. Okay. Um, okay. So there are more questions. More in licensing. I will address that in a moment when I actually deal with editing. Uh, We'll talk about adding new content. That's part of editing, uh, Margaret. Nora asks, could you explain us the options creating content inside creating a new page? I think, Nora, you're asking about adding content to the page, which is part of editing. Uh, so everyone's ready to go to editing. So let's talk about one thing before we go to editing. Uh, <clears throat> so is this my book? I'm going to... I have so many things open up. I'm going to go to my book. I can always click on here to go to my book and see what I have. So I have the ability to remix however I want. As long as I have a game plan for doing so, it works reasonably well in order to do so. Now comes the question about how we actually address the editing. And part of a dead editing comes in with additional features associated with attributions and compliance with licensing uh, and the ability to edit here. So I want to talk about the licensing after a break. Uh, but right now, I just want to talk about one aspect of editing. So... Most of us are familiar with the concept that we have some uh, we have on our computers, uh, an idea of making a duck that acts like a duck, quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, but isn't a duck. Now, of course, we're not talking about ducks here, talking about files. So you can create a shortcut on your computer that looks like a file and acts like a file, but it's not really a file. That could be on a, an Apple box, an alias, or if you're on a Linux box, it would be a symbolic link. It's the idea of building something that the content's actually stored somewhere else. That process is called transclusion. Uh, you could think of it as tethering using the adapt uh, parlance that I discussed earlier on today. And the idea is that the content that's stored on a page is not really stored on the page, but is really stored somewhere else. But for all intents and purposes, it looks like it's on the page. So here's the book that I, I was harvesting, that I was not harvesting, I was remixing. So I'm going to go to Organisms and Love. And it'll pull up this page. I'm going to go to Alfalfa. <clears throat> so here's Alfalfa. And this is the book that, this is the page that's on there. So it looks like the pay, the content is on this page. But I'm going to tell you it's not. And the reason I know it's not is because this little icon is right there. If that little icon is there, then I then this content would actually be stored on this page. Now, functionally, what's that mean? Well, you see that when you actually try to edit the page. So here's the page. I'm going to edit the page by using this edit button on the black bar. And it pulls up the page. And at the point that it pulls up a page, instead of showing me content to edit, just like you would think if this were a Google Doc or if it were on your learning management system, it's this little box that says, well, the content's really stored somewhere else. Now, if I click on this, this icon here, it will go to the other page uh, where the content is stored. And here it is. Yeah. So this right here doesn't have that icon on it. So I know if I were to edit this page, I would have a graphical user interface in order to edit the page, which looks like this. I'm going to get rid of that and save this. So now I've edited the content on the source page. This would be the equivalent, the alpha or primary phase. If I go to this page and I refresh it, you notice that this will then have this thing down here because I've deleted it because it's tethered to the thing or transclusion is the term off of there. Now, every page that you remix from will be will be a transcluded page by default. When you need to edit the page, there are two reasons why you need to edit a page. If you're just trying to fix a bug, 
off of here, then please let us know and we can go in and fix the source page. But if you're trying to customize the content, I think there was an individual that asked for changing uh, examples or localizing examples for your own uh, uh, campus or so. You want to edit something on here to make it more customized. <clears throat> then you need to do something that we call forking, which is the equivalent of cloning in Adapt when we had a question and we cloned it. This right here, you want to fork this question. The fork, sorry, fork this page. And we fork this page by going under options. And there's a thing called the forker. And you just click on the forker. And it will tell you it's going to fork this page. It'll transfer all content reused pages, which is transclusion, into editable content. Click on this thing and it'll actually come up here. It'll reload. And now the only thing that will be different is that icon is no longer there. The only thing that's different from the viewer, from the rendered product. But if you edit it, you now have editing rights to the content and you can edit it as you see fit, which is going to be the skills that we're going to be doing after a short break in a moment. Now, you may be wondering, why do we do this? Uh, <clears throat> Tracy, you're looking under uh, restrict access. Please look under Forker is all that we're dealing with right now. So the... Um, why do we do this? Uh, well, we do this for two reasons. Um, one is it reduces the amount of content in our database. So it makes it easier and makes it less bloat is one thing off of that. The second one is it helps to address the curation mandate that I mentioned is particularly important in how we operate. So when you actually have this content, for example, you have one source page and you have 30 other pages that are transcluded to it. If we fix it, fix a problem, a mistake, transclude, uh, not transclude, but handle the typesetting in some way, we can then make it so all 30 of those pages that are tethered to it can automatically benefit from it. So it makes it much better, much easier to curate the content. So you fork when you need to, otherwise, why make a copy of it? And you have the ability in order to fork any page as long as you have editing rights on that page, which you do because the remixer gives it to you in the books that you're doing on the pages that you were doing. Um, one last thing before I let you go, and I know there are a few questions that are connected off of here, uh, <clears throat> is down below is our attribution infrastructure. So when we bring in content on a page, actually any content on the page is organized in this way. We have an attribution connected to the page itself and an attribution connected to the content on the page. So this right here tells us that we have content on this page that came from a different source. Came from this page, 2.4 alfalfa by George Biggs with this license. And this is the license off here. This is full compliant with Creative Commons licensing 4.0 requirement. This right here is the license that we, we have on our page. So we can come in and we can call, uh, we can, I can put my name on here and my campus on here, I could brand this page myself, but I still have this licensing down below connected to the content off of here. If I have content from two different sources, this will actually be a, a longer list of uh, bulleted lists. So it will show you where everything comes from. Moreover, if you click on this, it will even color code and tell you where different things come from. If they come from different paragraphs from different pages that you brought into here. This is the auto attribution system. It's designed in order to make it so that we are as compliant as possible with Creative Commons licensing, providing you a mechanism to always have attributions for the content that we actually have put together, but then give you the ability in order to, uh, to manipulate the license on the page itself. Then comes issues in terms of compliance of licenses on the page versus the content license and things like that. That's beyond what we have time in order to discuss, uh, unless you have interest in order to discuss it uh, afterwards. So right now, <clears throat> I uh, and we're the only ones who do anything like this because we have things centralized, not decentralized, and we have a lot more control over that. Um, I want to address a few comments on here and then let you guys take a 10 to 15 minute break uh, off of here. So if you uh, if you need a break, um, feel free to take it now and we'll come back at two o'clock. I just want to spend a few moments here in order to address these things and let everyone go two o'clock my time. So um, 
Natalie, to confirm, if you want to edit the content, you need to fork it. Yes. Uh, uh, Simi, uh, Sima, sorry. Uh, so if you edit and takes place in the transcluded page, then the source content changes across all platforms and in the original. Yes. It, assuming you're still transcluded to the pages, not forked to the pages. Obviously, if you're forked, then you don't have any, it doesn't uh, propagate. Uh, Deborah asks, is transcluding similar to embedding? You know, some people actually argue that it is. Uh, I've never really jived into it that because it's different platforms, um, but it is essentially embedding the content from one page into another page, um, just like it were an iframe. In fact, it's probably not terribly dissimilar from an iframe infrastructure, um, like with learning management systems off of there. But because it's the same platform off of that, I don't typically consider it to be embedding into one thing because it's essentially the same thing. Um, so at the same level, so I, we have a different terminology for it. But yes, some people do call it that. <clears throat> um, Penny loves it, which I'm happy to hear. Uh, same I ask the question. Um, okay. Let's take a 12, 13-minute break. Uh